two years since its historic vote for equal marriage, how has the country changed for its LGBTQ population? Has the increased visibility brought about through the referendum made a difference, or do all prejudices still prevail? Throughout this series, we'll highlight the breadth and colour of our community, our successes and supports, our talents and trailblazers, and discuss what it's like to be LGBTQ in Ireland. and I'm a member of Gloria. And I'm Emmett and I'm a tenor in Gloria. Uh, Gloria is Dublin's gay and lesbian choir. Um, we're 60 individuals that so sing in four parts. Um, we're singers, we're just singers, yeah. And why and when was it founded? Well, it was founded in 1995, so we're 20 years old this year. Um, Carol Nelson, who actually sings with Therese, uh, placed an ad in GCN. To, she wanted to get a group of people together, uh, lesbian and gay people, to actually yeah, just sing together and you know, have fun. Like, we've done so much, I think, over the last 20 years. Like It's phenomenal, like from playing small gigs in Mother Redcaps, which is our first one, mm. to like singing in Boston, San Jose, um, you know, Canada, like we've sang all over the world and it's been, like Boston for me was one of the best ones because we were in this amazing venue and you had a lot of older Irish people and I remember we, we sang, um, I can't even remember now what the song was, but there was a woman in the front and her eyes, she was just crying because just with joy, wow. no, not, not because we were so bad. But so good, so just, good, so good. Yeah, it was, yeah. Ju- it was just a really incredible experience. Like for, for me, I think that was one of the best gigs I've ever done. It was just, it was lovely. Now you're very upfront about being like a LGBT choir. Um, has that helped or hindered you, do you think? Well, I think it's both because well, one of our objectives is around being visible. And, you know, again, like over the years, I think that was hugely significant. Uh, for the community that you actually had people going out to villages mm-hmm. and stuff like that and standing up in sort of the oddest places saying, you know, you're a lesbian gay choir. And it, it helped, I suppose, feed into some of the local lesbian and gay communities in smaller places that where you wouldn't yeah. have that. Yeah. So it sort of gave them, I suppose, an opportunity to actually host an event and stuff like that. So that's really helped. I think it's, I don't think it's necessarily hindered us, but I think it's caused us difficulties as well and again like we had to add LG, uh, LGBT to our tagline because some of the choral festivals wouldn't wouldn't say Gloria Dublin's lesbian and gay choir so we actually had to have it officially so that they had to say it mm-hmm. so again that was a big yeah. you know but it, it's key things around being visible I think yeah and you were saying a lovely thing earlier if you don't mind repeating it about um you know, families at Christmas, it's something that you can bring your family to an LGBT event. Yeah, it's just that I suppose a Christmas concert, I actually feel it for the community in general, that like it's a beautiful community event for us all and it's great to see the community come together in St. Pat's Cathedral for the last few years. I mean, Gloria, three years and I've been there for those three Christmas concerts and it's something that you can bring your granny and your mommy to, you know, so it's a nice kind of family event, but it's also a gay event, so mm. it's a celebration of our community and it's, it's yeah. really lovely, yeah. And just on a personal note, what has been your experience with Gloria? Why did you both join and uh, how's your experience been? Personally, I've joined, I joined three years ago in September. Um, For me, it felt like a real homecoming. Not that I'd ever been in a gay choir before, but just like that sense of community and that sense of belonging was uh, really important to me in my youth, actually with Belong To. Um, And so to come into like a similar kind of community and welcoming setting was lovely, where I could just totally be authentic at all times. And to celebrate music as well was just great. So it means the world to me and I met some spectacular people and made some real good friends and developed my interest in music. I joined in, I think it was 97, 98. So the choir was very, it was early sorts of days. 
Um, and it was a huge thing for me again and it's helped with my coming out I suppose as well even though I've been out for I suppose a good few years before that but it, it did help with that because you were actually you, you know you had to you were standing on stage and people were saying you know you were saying we're lesbian and gay choir so that, mm-hmm, it, it mm-hmm. definitely helped me become more comfortable yeah. I suppose with myself but I suppose the biggest thing for me is really like is that whole sense of family and friends and I think Glory is quite unique in that we're 50-50 men and women mm. And there's very few community groups, lesbian gay community yes, groups, absolutely. where you have that split. So I've made some great friends in the choir and have a lot of close male friends, yeah. which I'd never have done if I hadn't been in Gloria. Totally. You know, so, yeah. I mean, and that's been really important. And I think being able to go on a Tuesday night to a rehearsals and no matter how shite your week or how bad your week has been, <laughs> um, you know, and it's just there. Totally, yeah, do you know, it's and really it's the lesbian thing. gay bit of my week and it is, do you know, and that's it's just yeah. great, yeah. Do you know, it's great. Lovely. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm Mia Campbell and I'm a drag king here in Dublin. Um, well, I actually started drag, I'd say about 12, 13 years ago. Um, I originally, I went to a lesbian arts festival, the Dublin Lesbian Arts Festival. Um, I was invited by a friend um, and we went along to see a show and one part of that show was a performance by a drag king troupe called the Shamcocks. Um, and I was absolutely mesmerized. And I just thought it was amazing. And I sat there going, I could do that, I could definitely do that. Sure, I get mistaken for a man four or five times a week anyway. I might as well just, you know, put a beard on and make it official, you know. Ironically, um, Una McEvitt, the playwright and director, uh, she was the person who'd brought me to see this show. And she and I decided we were going to audition together to be a part of the Shamcocks. But we went along and I'd never done drag before. I'd seen them on stage obviously. Uh, Una and I sat there with, we'd, we'd looked it up and we were told you get hair, you cut the hair up small and you gloat in your face and that's how you become a drag king, do you know. And we had gotten, the one thing we'd gotten that was actually the correct product to use was a spirit gum and we stood in the bathroom trying to cut up the nylon hair with these tiny scissors while 12 year old girls ran around in between our feet asking us what we were doing. So we explained, you know, we were becoming drag kings and then had to go to the efforts of explaining what that even meant. But the crux of it being, with our spirit gum and our cut up hair, it looked like we glued pubes to our faces. Uh, but it was great fun and, you know, from mm. that point, it just, it spawned into many more wonderful projects and endeavors. And with your knowledge of like the, the drag king scene in Ireland. Was there a big one back then? Has it evolved? Has it grown? It's, it's been interesting. It's had its various evolutions. Um, my first consciousness of drag kinging in Ireland was when um, a girl called Rachel created a drag character called Johnny Silvino. And basically it was like a big quiff and a real kind of sleazy card playing uh, gangster type guy. And she had started doing um, gigs around Ireland. And she started then working with Sid Viscous, who was um, a friend of mine, Jude, back then, and the person that I'd approached to ask to be part of the Shamcocks. Um, but certainly in terms of regular performers, there were about 10 to 12. Um, but for the most part, it was like, I'd say 10 core kings. And then um, I got the opportunity to travel with them over to Chicago what's called the International Drag King Extravaganza. It was like Comic-Con for, you know, lesbians who dress as men. Um, and it was basically this huge um, convention whereby kings from all over North America, Canada, um, and we were in this big theater in, right in the heart of uh, Chicago. And there was just, I'd say maybe five, 6,000 women there to watch this giant production of drag kings from all around the world. So I had to learn the whole routine that morning and I've never been so terrified to walk out on the stage, but to walk out and just see the sea of women, all of whom understood and appreciated and were wholeheartedly there to enjoy a drag king show. And where did the character of Phil come from? Can you tell us a bit about him? Um, I think because my first introduction to drag was just the notion of getting on stage 
as a male character, it didn't necessarily have a backstory to begin with. Like I didn't have an explanation of who Phil was. It was just more an inherent sense of how I really envisage myself as a man. Me as Phil on a microphone is a slightly more brash and offensive version of me in normal day-to-day -day life. Too. And how does it feel when you're doing it? Do, do you do you feel free or do you feel like oh, yeah. it's kind of a, oh, yeah, yeah. an outlet for you? It's Yeah, it's an amazing experience because I, and even to this day, when you're doing it multiple times a week, it, it has that potential to suck all the creativity out of it, you know, especially if you're expected to be generating new material all the time because you're then trawling through like the charts online to find out what's popular with the kids, you know? And you're like, Jesus, when did I become that person? And you feel, it makes you feel really old. But then on the flip side, you get something um, like Monday, for example, where it's less heavily reliant on the actual numbers themselves. I can be whatever the hell I want to be because unlike the George on a Monday or a Thursday, say where the audience is whoever has traipsed in that day. They're not necessarily there specifically to see the show. Well, obviously some are. Uh, the vast majority, it's because it's open. They just happen to be out on that night. Um, and the show is just a, a handy bonus on the night. So they're out for a drink. And what next? How do you keep, like, do you think you've reached a certain level now where your career will have its own momentum? Or is it always very difficult to keep working as a drag king? Um, at the moment, I've certainly not been struggling for gigs anyway. And I, I think certainly I've a huge amount of gratitude to Davina for giving me that first platform on the queer scene because, you know, no one had really given a king a chance before. And I think she saw an opportunity to do something different. But when we started working together, there was definitely that recognition of, okay, well, I there are opportunities here. And the more I did it, and then when I booked the second gig in the George, the more you get to openly go, well, look, you know, I have two residencies. That, that's unheard of in Ireland, you know. It gives you leverage then to be a commodity that people might actually want. Hi, I'm Danny McMacken and I'm the current chairperson of Wet n Wild Sports Club. Uh, well, Wet n Wild is a group of LGBT guys and girls. Uh, we get involved in a variety of different activities, really around the ethos of sports activities uh, and adventure orientated activities. And why and when was it founded? How did it come about? It was founded by a couple of friends back in 2009. They had the idea of creating this group which would serve members of the LGBT community that were looking for some activities which were different to the usual social activities of uh, going out on nights out, uh, revolving around bars and clubs and these particular members had interests and qualifications actually in areas like and activities like rock climbing and kayaking so they came up with this idea of getting the word out getting people to come along for these activities and it really spawned from there and it's grown and grown really over the last six years and how does it operate like who comes up with the ideas who organizes it is it kind of member based or committee based uh, it's actually both. We have a formal committee made up of five members and that's the way the group has really worked over the last six years. So we have a chairperson, secretary and three other members involved in uh, other different roles uh, just to help with the organisation of activities and running of the club itself. It's entirely in a vol voluntary capacity I do want to say. So. We try to encourage members to organise activities or to come up with ideas. Most of the activities are created and managed by members of the committee themselves and also 
members who have been involved with wet and wild activities over the last few years and as we get new members in which we do all the time and we're actively looking for new members to come along and just have a good time uh, we try and get them hooked in as well and just get get them uh, involved in uh, in the wet and wild spirit so if you could give some highlights like i know you do like surfing weekends and things like that well i suppose the biggest highlight i can think of was last year uh, in 2014 uh, Wet n Wild were nominated for an award uh, as uh, one of the best sporting groups in Ireland uh, in the Gala Awards. So we got to attend the function in the Shelburne. Unfortunately, we didn't win. Uh, we uh, lost out on the night to the Dublin Devils, uh, but fair play to those guys because uh, they fully deserved it, uh, having uh, created the wonderful uh, or managed the wonderful uh, sport, uh, European gay football tournament the previous year, so they're uh, well deserved. Uh, we organise weekends uh, all throughout the year, maybe over the winter time we take a break, but the kind of things we get involved in are surfing weekends, uh, rock climbing weekends, kayaking weekends, uh, those are the main weekend activities and then interspersed uh, then throughout the rest of the year uh, over different weekends and indeed evening activities as well. Uh, we do things like this rock climbing. Uh, we're, we're here in Gravity in Inchicore today so it's a popular event with members and uh, we run rounders in the Phoenix Park over the summertime as well so it's a nice evening activity and Whilst we do focus on the activities, we also want to promote the social aspect of the club as well in creating a social outlet for members of the LGBT community, guys and girls. Uh, I do want to stress that uh, we're not one way or the other. We uh, like to encourage anybody to come along uh, and of course allies as well. Everyone's welcome. And all we ask is just that you bring a sense of fun and adventure and uh, really that helps everyone to have a good time. So it's definitely battling the assumption that uh, gay people don't like sports. Yeah. Absolutely, I, I don't know where they get that kind of idea from. Yeah, everyone that comes along to our activities I don't think I've ever met any member or spoken to any member or even heard anecdotally from any member over the years that anyone has gone to an activity and didn't enjoy themselves. It can be difficult turning up to an event when you don't know anybody and uh, I'm really proud of the fact that we have a good reputation uh, in the LGBT community that people know that wet and wild events are fun and even if they don't know anyone that uh, it's great to see people having the courage to come along and i know that anyone that comes along is guaranteed a good time is there ever a worry when events are books that you can't mention that you're a gay group or anything like that have you ever encountered any problems with that it's, it can be a concern, I suppose, especially if we don't have an established relationship with uh, different centres. I have to say from my own experience, I haven't had any negative uh, interactions or uh, negative experiences with any of the companies that we're involved in, that we promote to those companies that we have our established pages uh, for managing events on the likes of Meetup and our Facebook group has been in operation since 2009 so they can see for themselves that we are involved in many different types of events and that we're really just out to participate, have fun and uh, yeah, there's nothing, nothing that they need to be anyway concerned about uh, in terms of the fact that it's uh, a gay group. And yeah, we have some great working relationships with uh, a number of companies all throughout Ireland, especially in Donegal. Uh, we've got a great working relationship with Narossa Surf School. They're based in Dunfanaghy in County Donegal, and they've actually organised international surf trips with us. So uh, the last two years, we've organised a group of guys to go over with the Narossa team to south of France and they go there for a week of surfing and sightseeing and everyone's had a great time so yeah it's it really helps then to uh, to promote the club and that we have ambassadors then for uh, Wet n Wild just uh, just to show that uh, there's 
nothing uh, nothing to be anyway concerned about uh, with uh, LGBT groups. And how would people get involved if they wanted to sign up some of the activities? Well, all of our events are managed on the Meetup website, so you can go to www.meetup.com forward slash wet hyphen wild. We're also on Facebook. If you search Wet and Wild Sports Club, you'll find us. And we also have our website, which is www.wetandwildsportsclub.com and all the information of all of our events and pictures from past events, they're all up there. Great stuff. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Benny.